So next up is Adam Gazali, and as Adam's working his way up, uh, uh, I'm going to make it a quick introduction because I can't wait to get right to Adam. Um, he is, uh, as it says there, the founder and executive director of Neuroscape, which really is an innovative uh, academic laboratory that brings technology and neuroscience together. And he's done terrific and important work over, over many years looking at game design in particular, similar to the work we just heard about, uh, for a wide variety of different areas. Historically, Adam hasn't worked as much in VR. But recently, he really has, and he's going to show us some of the, the latest and greatest uh, toys and science, and I can't wait to hear what he's got to share with us today. So thank you, Adam, for being with us today, and take it away. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Sounds great. Thanks for the opportunity to speak here today. As, as you heard, this is a relatively new domain for me. Um, I decided, given the brief time that we have, uh, I want to focus on five new uh, VR projects, neuroscience inspired, and because they are works in progress, I can't give you results on them yet, but I will describe the design principles that we use in the technology development as well as the hypotheses that guide the research studies. Um, but I want to begin by placing in context why we would talk about VR and the brain in, in, in the scope of this meeting. And um, really what I've come to believe is one of the most important global challenges of our time that we face is this goal of enhancing human cognition. Just to break that down a little bit, when it comes to both assessing and optimizing our cognition, and I'm defining that broadly, our attention, perception, memory, reasoning, decision-making, our imagination and our creativity, our emotional regulation, as well as our empathy and compassion, we are tragically lacking. And we're paying a great price for this. We know over half a billion people around the planet are suffering debilitating effects of deficits in cognition. And these numbers are rising, notably for seniors with dementia, as well as deficits in attentional and emotional regulation in our youth. Um, but this presents us with a really interesting, important, and timely question that I think brings us all here today. How can we use technology to enhance our cognition, broadly defined as I did? I just want to start with a quote. This is a, a friend of mine, John Favreau, who's a, a Hollywood director, producer, writer. And he said to me in a fireside chat that we did on virtual reality and storytelling that I want to find the humanity in the technology. And I was really struck by this sentiment because I think it's actually the most important message right now to the technology world in general that we need to think about how we create technologies that enhance us as humans and not diminish us. And it's a really great time to have this conversation with this audience because we are not only seeing the emergence in the consumer domain of head-mounted displays and really high-level auditory um, devices like, headset, uh, like headphones. We're also seeing the emergence of augmented reality that can integrate seamlessly with virtual reality. Wireless, smart, physiological uh, recording devices, uh, motion capture, full-body motion capture, eye motion capture and advances in machine learning algorithms and other forms of AI. The really, really exciting thing is that all of these are going to integrate together to create very powerful experiences that can be used to better understand our brains and cognition, and because they harness neuroplasticity, can allow us to improve these abilities. Now, not all experiences are created equal, but one of the biases I have is for a very particular type of experience that drives something called the closed-loop system. So I want to break this down first in a cartoon. So your brain is interacting with some form of digitally delivered experience. Now, I tend to favor video games for their immersion and their fun, their deep engagement, the compliance, but it doesn't have to be. That's not required. So your brain is interacting, and your performance metrics are generating um, data in real time that can be captured by sensors, like an accelerometer or a tap screen. This data can then be used to update in real time the environment that the brain is being exposed to. So the challenge that you're experiencing so that it's not so hard that you give up because you're frustrated, not so bored, uh, easy that you're bored and give up, really put you right in that perfect zone, in that flow state. We can also give you rewards and feedback in real time, which creates deep immersion in the moment. We could bring on the other technologies we talked about, motion capture and physiological recording, which are consumer available, now can have uh, the ability to capture a more comprehensive view of your state in the moment, feed that into the engine, the software engine, and then drive back a much more immersive real-world experience through virtual reality. 
That's how I see virtual reality fitting in this. We could then wrap all this together with advances in machine learning algorithm, algorithms to create a truly integrated multimodal closed loop system. What better use is there of AI than to drive HI, human intelligence? And I think that's what we're looking at here. We don't really have this yet with all the pieces, but this is what we are uh, heading towards. I just want to, before I dive into the VR examples, I want to take you on a very quick decade-long story about my involvement with NeuroRacer, which is a non-VR-related interactive experience designed to improve cognition. So 10 years ago, I reached out to friends of mine at LucasArts. I was working as a professor at UCSF, frustrated with our studying of the brain, especially of older adults and their attention abilities, which was my research focus, but not really doing anything to help them. And I won't go into the long discussion of my frustration with pharmaceuticals as the only thing that us neurologists usually reach for in these situations. But I built this game. I designed it. My friends at LucasArts helped uh, develop it. It's called NeuroRacer. I'm not going to break it down in detail now, but essentially it's a game that pushes you to resist distraction, to rapidly multitask and switch your attention with the hypothesis that because networks in the brain involved in cognitive control overlap, if you get better at this, you will see improvements outside of the game transferred to other cognitive control abilities like sustained attention and very short-term memory, what we call working memory. And so we did a study after building this, and just a quick look at some of the data, we showed that multitasking abilities on this game reveal this pattern. So 20-year-olds, despite the fact that they believe, at least the ones in San Francisco, that they are multitasking masters, suffer a 27% decrement in, in multitasking on this game compared to single-tasking. And then we observed that this ability doesn't just maintain itself at a plateau, only to plummet in one tragic year when you're 69. You plummet every tragic year of your life, just like this. <laughs> that is the pattern that we see with multitasking on the game. We showed that after a month of play by seniors, 12 hours over the course of the month, we improved their ability to multitask on the game dramatically. We recorded brain activity during gameplay, showing that it was an increase in the engagement of the prefrontal uh, cortex uh, interaction, its network with the rest of the brain. And we confirmed the hypothesis that other abilities not directly trained, sustained attention and working memory, also improved significantly. We published this at the end of 2013 in this journal in Nature. You see we got that beautiful pun by Nature on the cover, which really set off two events that I want to just take you through. The first was moving this outside of the lab into the real world. To help form a company called Achille, which licensed the technology patent behind that game from UCSF. UCSF owns it, I'm the inventor, Achille has a license. What Achille's done, which is quite unusual, is built, bring on an amazing AAA level uh, video game design team, a scientific team, a healthcare team, built a way better version of the game on top of the game engine that was defined by NeuroRacer, and now has taken the game through numerous studies to validate it as a diagnostic and therapeutic closed loop video game. No consumer version yet available. Not one drop of revenue, unfortunately, yet in this company. But all of these studies are going on. One I just want to notice is our completion of a phase three study of ADHD, which was positive, which is now advanced in front of the FDA to get the first ever non, uh, cleared non-drug treatment for ADHD, uh, the first prescribable video game, and the first of what we view as a new category of medicine. This is a de novo pathway, a digital medicine. So right now, we have pharmaceutical medicines that deliver molecular treatments. A digital medicine delivers an experiential treatment. It's the experience that drives plasticity to change the brain. In this case, our video game is essentially like our pill, how we deliver that experience in a deep way that has great compliance. So that's Achilles' story. Back in my lab, everything changed. No one wanted to do basic cognitive neuroscience anymore. We now do what we call translational neuroscience. How do we bridge this gap that we perceive to exist in the non-invasive, consumer-friendly technology world and neuroscience for positive impact? So my lab became a center called Neuroscape. I'll just show you a couple pictures of it. It's quite an unusual neuroscience laboratory. This is our control room. This is one of our laboratories. We're now building 13 more on UCSF campus, as well as several of these around the world. They're an interactive media lab that also records physiology during gameplay. There's an MRI scanner on the opposite side of this wall, as well as an EEG lab, blood testing. So we could do deep, deep research dives on different clinical populations to observe what the impact of digital medicine is. Let's switch to VR. So over the last five years, we've been taking this concept of the closed loop 
digitally delivered experiential treatment and thinking about the value of VR as I described to you in that animation. The areas that we focus on are attention, perception, and memory. It's where we have our scientific background. It's where these actually form the building blocks of all higher order cognition and they're impaired across multiple psychiatric and neurological diseases. I just want to show you two VR games that we've been working on. We have not started testing them yet. So usually it takes us two years to build each game. We have a dozen games at Neuroscape and then at least another couple of years to do the first pass um, randomized control trial. So the first game that I want to tell you about, and I'll speak over this, is called Coherence. I'll give you a quick look at it. So when you play Coherence, you see, you hear, and you feel stimuli that are adaptively adjusting to challenge you rhythmically based upon your accuracy, your precision, and your consistency of rhythmic engagement. So because rhythm involves anticipation and timing, which is true for our entire attentional system, we hypothesize that if we can make you more rhythmic, we will see benefits in your sustained and selective attention abilities. Believe it or not, no one has yet ever done that study of trying to make someone more rhythmic, documenting it, and seeing what the benefits are on cognition. But so that's how we will advance to the um, randomized control trial. One of our first population is dyslexia, children with dyslexia, where the relationship between rhythm and language acquisition has already been identified. So we might be looking at a new VR dyslexia treatment in the future. The other game I want to tell you is called Labyrinth. So in Labyrinth, you are dropped into a 3D world like this. You um, navigate, as you'll see here, and learn target locations in this 3D environment. So you have a certain number of tasks to do. The 3D environments adapt um, to your spatial navigation abilities to continue to offer um, memory challenges to you. So because our hippocampal system evolutionarily um, was designed and basically evolved to help us navigate environments such as these, we hypothesize if we can improve your spatial navigation abilities, we will also improve your memory performance more generally. So those are two uh, games at Neuroscape that are in development that'll be uh, entering testing soon. The other thing that we care a lot about is using technology almost in the flip side, not to put pressure on the system to improve cognition, but how do we restore from cognitive fatigue and deal with stress and changes in mood? For that, we're inspired by a literature, a pretty substantial literature, on the benefits of nature exposure. And we are testing whether or not a virtual reality nature environment, especially that has access to your physiology, could act as a tool to improve stress and mood, as well as restoration from cognitive fatigue. Taking this concept to the next level, I want to introduce the idea of sensory synchronization. So the idea is that if we could stimulate all of your senses in unison, we will create a phenomenon in the brain known as multisensory integration. This is well described physiologically, especially in animal models. Multisensory integration leads to another phenomena known as the unity effect, which is essentially the basis of our perception of reality. It's how we form constructs for entities like places and people um, and things and objects. And so the hypothesis is that if we can create a sensory synchronized experience, we will have a dramatic sense of reality that can displace us from the burdens of our mind and unlock new potential approaches for relaxation, for restoration, for meditation, and even possibly for transformation. So that's the idea. The frustrating part is that we, at least I believe, we do not yet have a device that can offer such an integrated sensory experience across all of our senses. And so I want to actually unveil for the first time a new company um, that I helped co-found to do that called SenseSync. So SenseSync is built on the principle that sensory synchronization, when um, delivered at a very high level, will induce these effects that I just described. To do that, we created a device that we call a sensory immersion vessel. Now I want to point out, this is not a pod. A pod contains you. A vessel is something that you go in to take a journey or travel, and that is what our goal is here. So here's another look around it. You could see, um, from my perspective, this is essentially the opposite of a sensory deprivation tank. 
All right, so you could take a, a sort of look at this design. This has now been completely developed. So what the vessel is designed to do is to deliver an experience that you see, hear, smell, and feel across all these domains, multiple tactile domains, in a sensory synchronized nature experience. While this is going on, we're recording in real time your physiological responses and integrating that with the nature environment that you're exposed to. Really taking the concept of the closed loop virtual experience to the next level. So it's early days, but I could tell you that this is all built. I've been in it, and it is amazing. We're getting there. It's still a lot of work to get to the final software integration, but we're very excited about it. All right, one more step into the future, and I want to tell you about a technology called the glass brain. The glass brain is a technology out of Neuroscape. I know I'm wearing a lot of hats up here. This is an integration of MRI and real-time EEG. Obviously, it's not real-time right now, but this is actually my glass brain, and if I was wearing a 64-channel mobile wireless EEG cap where this data was recorded, you'd be watching my brain responding to presenting to you right now. What you're looking at here is my brain responding to playing one of our video games. And so we do multiple processing stages within 200 milliseconds of your engagement with an environment. Now, why are we building this? The main reason we're building this is to ultimately close the loop. So right now, our interactive experiences are driven by your performance metrics. And as we're starting to see, I didn't show you examples yet, your heart rate, a little bit of electrodermal activity. But if we had access to how your brain is processing information in the moment, we can guide the closed loop system, how challenge and rewards are delivered adaptively based upon the processing of information in your brain in the moment. We think this will allow us to target those systems and almost be like a surgical approach to applying a digital medicine. So as we continue that work, and as, as I said, this is a bit futuristic, this is a real-time brain visualization, but it is complex. The brain has a lot going on, some of it not really directly related to cognition, much of it not, and so we need to bring on advances in pattern classification and machine learning to be able to mine this data to make it interpretable in real time. The other thing, and I'm going to conclude with one other video, we don't have a clinical example of this, but we're very intrigued by the idea of a real time neural diagnostic tool that uses this, especially one in virtual reality. And so I'm going to show you an example of an on-stage um, an on-stage demo of this. This was at the GT GDC keynote several years ago, so like 4,000 people in the audience, giant screen, and I brought on stage Mickey Hart, who is the drummer from The Grateful Dead and one of the inspirations behind our Coherence Rhythm uh, project. And what you're going to see here is not a clinical example, but I think you'll be able to make the intuitive leap to it being one. So let's take a look at Mickey here. So Mickey has, this is the early days, has an Oculus uh, Rift on an early version, has a 64 channel EG headset. The screen is so big you can't see Mickey's view, but he's playing a game called Neurodrummer, so he can't see the audience at all. He's playing the game, and sitting next to him is Tim Mullins, one of the engineers on our design team. He's also a virtual reality headset, but he's not seeing what Mickey's playing. Instead, he's flying through Mickey's brain in real time, watching the responses of Mickey's brain to the environment environment that he's in. So sort of we have like a Russian neuro nested dolls here, right? Mickey's inside his virtual reality training platform and Tim is inside Mickey's brain. You can imagine a future where he has a virtual um, keyboard or a platform to be able to navigate into different brain areas, push on levers, increase the challenges, see how the brain responds. This could be a very interesting new approach to therapy, couple relationship building, in, you know, a lot of potential out there. Anyway, I think it's, um, it's exciting to think about this type of real-time brain visualization as well as the new approach to therapeutics as well as a new uh, way of having diagnostic entities inside the virtual reality domain. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention.